pitching average that he has. And you throw the whip in there, the walks and hits per innings pitch is less than one. In fact, it's less than .90. Just amazing. Here is Michael Bourne. He takes strike one over the outside corner. First pitch strike, such a big part of his game. And that's what he does. He gets ahead of hitters. He tries to expand that strike zone. And then he just, you know, he'll throw any pitch at any time. That is the curveball. That is strike two to Bourne. Now, with regard to Bourne, we spoke of him earlier. On base percentages, you're way up 362. He has 19 stolen bases. And he doubles up on that curveball, doesn't he? What do you do if you're a hitter and you're facing Danny Heron? Just try to jump into a hitter's shoes right here. You know, this guy throws a fastball. He'll throw the cutter on you. He'll throw the curveball. He'll throw the splitter. He'll throw any pitch, any time. So as a hitter, you're always caught in between pitches a lot of times. You can't really zone Danny Heron and sit on one pitch. That's what makes him so hard to hit. Good fastball on 0-2. That little bit of run away from a lefty. The play is made out there by Gerardo Parra. And again, buried that pitch in. And again, he's expanded the strike zone, so he's going to come inside, makes him pull his hands in tight. Hitters do not like to do that. And when you pull that hand, those hands in tight, there's a lot of movement in that swing. He got underneath it, popped it up. So you keep Bourne off the base pads, which certainly is your goal. This is a guy that all of May until now hitting well over 300, doing big things on the base pads. 13 of his stolen bases since... May the 1st, and now there's Miguel Tejada. Right back to the screen it goes. A couple of former Oakland Athletics dueling here. Since 2000, one of the best offensive shortstops in the game. Only Derek Jeter has more hits in that time. No one has more home runs. Fastball in. It's a foul ball, so no balls and two strikes to count. Defensively for the Diamondbacks. Para, CY, and Justin Upton. Then it's Roberts, Drew, Lopez, and Reynolds on the infield. Chris Snyder works behind home plate. Tonight, the Houstonian works with Dan Heron. And we talk about Tejada and, and the amount of RBIs that he's had over the years. He's up there. He doesn't look for a walk. He's up there hacking. He's not trying to get on base. He's trying to drive guys in. And when you're hitting, why not? Why change your approach? It's funny, you know, we talk about different hitters, and some guys like to go up there and be selective before they're aggressive. Other guys like to be aggressive before they're selective. Now, he's definitely an aggressive, selective hitter. Lance Berkman, one of the game's best switch hitters career-wise, having a tough year this year, at least from what we're used to. I thought, Candy, you made the best point about Berkman, though, that you can look at that 253 and overlook him. That'd be a big mistake. Well, when you're getting ready to... You know, pitch against this Houston Astro lineup as a pitcher. You're trying to keep certain guys off bases and certain guys not to beat you. He's one of the guys you don't want to beat you. Bouncing ball to the right side. And to the bag, Mark Reynolds makes the play for the out. You know, Tejada will also, he'll go to right field, he'll go to center, he'll go to left. You know, he's not particular where he hits the ball. Speaking of not particular. Hunter Pence is not particular what you think about his stance, how he goes about his game, because this year again it is netting him fine results. Very unorthodox with everything he does. Not too many guys nowadays really choke up on the bat either. Hunter Pence does. You watch where his hands are. You know, a lot of hitters have the high hands up high. You know, Hunter Pence, is, their hands are, are fairly low. You know, but he chokes up on the bat, which means he gets it around just a little bit quicker. You see that just that little bit of a, a choke there. Nice. Curveball, one and one. Yeah, excellent curveball in there. You see how Barry Bonds used to choke up on the bat. Watch when he gets ready. See where his hands are right here? Just that little bit. Fires a fastball to count one and two. Why does he do that? Why does he just not get a, a smaller bat? Most of the time, they like to, if you, if you get a bigger bat, you have better wood in it. Okay. You get much better wood, salt, more solid wood in the barrel. If you get a smaller, lighter bat, then the wood's not going to be as dense. It's not going to okay. be as hard. So a lot of guys will take that heavier stock and either cup it out at the end or choke up on the bat a little bit. This is a man that goes all the way down to the end of his bat, Carlos Lee. It's that weighted bat right now to get loose. 
the 2 2. Oh my goodness, cut fastball strike three. You want to talk about a dominating inning of work. Welcome to Phoenix, Arizona. Mike Hampton, time for you to clock in. They also took batting practice today as well. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for the still brand new skipper of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Southwest Airlines brings you the lineup with Lopez at the top and then Para. Justin Upton, he just keeps on keeping on. Stephen Drew, Mark Reynolds, Chris Young, Chris Snyder out of Houston, Texas. Young is as well. Brian Roberts and Dan Heron. 37 years old, Floridian Mike Hampton. Makes his off-season home here in the Valley. Began his career with Seattle. Had big years with Houston as a young man. Veteran Mike Hampton. Look out, Mike Hampton. Right back through the box. Felipe Lopez says, good to see you again. And Lopez is on. Leadoff hitter extraordinaire. He has been blistering lefties all season long. The switch hitter. Boy, just very aggressive. Looking for a fastball. The first pitch, he gets it. Hampton's a great fielding pitcher, but this ball was by him before he could even react to it. Try to play a little hacky sack with it. Try to kick it with his foot to no avail. Gerardo Parra. And we talk a lot about how Gerardo becomes a much better hitter. With a runner on base, this time he tries to be a better bunter, and he moves him over. Now, my question for you is right away, was he bunting for a hit there? I don't think he was bunting for a hit, but I, I think what he was doing, I think he had to sacrifice. But I think on the first time, he'll try to go ahead and, and drop one down there, and if you can beat it out, you can beat it out for a hit. But I think he was giving himself up to get Felipe Lopez over to second base. And now I'm being unfair to you as I ask you to guess really do you think he did that on his own or do you think it was given to him I think it was given to okay. him. okay that's my guess get a runner in scoring position in, in front of this man is what you're saying you can decline to answer I, obviously no you know if, if, it's, <laughs> if it's me if I'm the manager I want to give him as little to think about as possible and to make decisions I want to try to take as much control and 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 you know give him the bunt sign right away now if he tries to bunt for a hit and and does it all the better but you got to get that guy over so they do get him over a sacrifice bunt. Justin Upton takes low Justin Upton yesterday well actually his last couple of days have been fabulous he drives out of the right after having a pitch in to buzz his tower late in the ball game knock him off the plate that's how he answered back and that was the decisive second RBI of the game. Three hits, a couple of walks, a homer, three RBIs in his last two games. Good pitcher. Backed off on that one. Yeah, I think it was a changeup. You know, Hampton's, 
nowhere near the stuff that he once had. You know, he used to bring it up there, pretty good, good hard sinker. You know, now he's throwing everything up there. A the cut fastball, he's turning it over, throwing a lot of change-ups. You know, he'll throw that the cut fastball up there, the curveball. He'll throw everything. He's got the kitchen sink. Yeah, he is fastball usage. You and I were talking about that before the game. It's way down. Upton pulls that one on the ground quickly to short. The play is made by Miguel Tejada. Wasn't able to drive it to center field was Justin Upton. But certainly if he was, it would have been a tall task. He would have had to get it off the wall. Because this is Michael Bourne yesterday against the Cubs up Towles Hill making that play. Like a Hoff power saying thanks a lot. You hit a ball that far and it gets caught. A guy laying on his back and catches it. So now Stephen Drew. The runner did move up to third, so if there is a wild one, the run could score, but Upton comes up empty. Lopez at third. Drew had that hitting streak snapped yesterday, but he did walk. He has hit in 14 of his last 15 games. 21 hits during that time. Good change up, one and one. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago he was on the interstate. He's hitting about a buck 75, but he has climbed a lot. Driving the ball more to all fields. They're going to peek in at Lopez. You see where he stands with Chip Hale keeping a watchful eye on him. I'd like to see him take this ball to left center field. Huge gap out in left center field with. Hampton on the mound. I'm a little surprised because usually with the lefty on lefty, they play the left handed hitters to hit the opposite way. That one dives away. Has the look of a slider, but when you talk with the Astros folks, that's what he calls his cutter. Looks like a slider, though. Yeah, it's, it's hard to differentiate between the two. You know, and some guys can make their cut fastball break a little bit more at times. It depends on the finger pressure you put on it and, and just how you tilt it on your hand. So you know, he's one of those field pitchers that you know, he has the ability to make it break a little more times. The 3 1 in on the hands. Well, I tell you, when he was the young Mike Hampton, and first of all, kudos to him for still being here. He battled health issues for several years. But when he was the young Mike Hampton, that power sinker, one of the best in the baseball. We'll talk about his hitting later. I mean, he can <laughs> flat out hit. His career really changed when he went to Colorado and signed a contract there. Has battled injuries ever since. As that one runs away, a fine at bat for Stephen Drew. Mark Reynolds now has two RBIs out there for him. You think a couple of those Astro pitchers, you know, Daryl Kyle was another guy from Houston, just tremendous curveball. You you take that to Coors Field at the time and couldn't really do anything. Hampton the same way. Just these are pre-humidor days. Sure. Russ Ortiz has been pitching very well of late. Former Diamondback. Kind of at the bottom end of that rotation. Getting a, a chance to keep his career alive and he's taking advantage. Reynolds has to tap dance out of the way. Another familiar face. Calf problems. He will be activated tomorrow. For the game. Jose Valverde. The 1 0. Good pitch. Very rarely does he throw a straight fastball like that. Yeah, he's trying to, he's looking on movement. Movement, change of speeds, turning the ball over, he'll cut it. You know, Reynolds starts with a slight open stance, and he starts diving in there. He can get that ball out over the plate. He has shown us this year, Mark Reynolds, that. He has immense power, not just pretty good power, immense power the other way. So should they choose to pitch him away, it is not even a challenge to drive it that way. And I don't know any park that can hold this guy, even the opposite way. The 2-1. Good off speed. Looked like that dove under the bat. That's the pitch he calls the cutter. But the count is two and two. You know, we talked about this before the game. When Danny Heron's on the mound, we know every one of his pitches that he throws. It's very easy to see. You bet. You get a guy like Mike Hampton, it's tough because the slider sometimes breaks, the cutter breaks, sometimes it doesn't. It's very hard to tell his pitches. 
This will be a fastball in. And to the right side it goes. Charging in. Diving. It's off the glove of Hunter Pence. One run is in. Stephen Drew, come on down, says Chip Hale. Pence fires it to the plate. It is not in time. The Diamondbacks lead it 2 to nothing. Reynolds goes the other way. Reynolds has great plate coverage. And if you're going to continue to pitch him away, he's going to dive out there and take the ball the opposite direction. He nails this ball to right field. Pence comes a long way. He has good speed, but when he dives, the ball gets away from him like a good 20 feet. Throws it in or makes a close play. Drew with a great head first slide. That's two big runs for Danny Heron. Mark Reynolds, five for his last 11 with runners in scoring position. Six RBIs during that time. Arizona two. Houston nothing. Chris Young. We've talked about the ups and downs that he's gone through this year. A little bit better of late. On base percentage anyway is up in his last seven games. Up to 394. Still nowhere near where he wants to be, but he's facing a team from his hometown, and for some reason, he's killed the Astros in his young career. As that one is high. Better said, 12 games, 18 hits, four homers, hitting 375, on base over 400 against the Astros. He's the Astro killer. He certainly is. He's ahead in the count to a. Get him to throw in nothing straight. Might have been the cut fastball, maybe trying to come in a little bit. We've talked about this the last couple of days, and we've been keeping an eye on Chris Young. Jack Howell sharing with us that Young's hands a little bit further away from his body, a little bit lower. Whatever fits, really. Like Chad Tracy tries to fit as he takes a strike. The hands become such a huge issue for hitters. Goodness. Not good with runners in scoring position. That number will only climb. Well said by the color analyst as that one bounces in there. Or at least you certainly hope so. That's my guess. That Chris knows it. He knows it. That knocked me back in my chair. <laughs> he knows it. Yeah, again, the last week or so has been better. It's been a slow and steady climb. At bats are getting better, walking more. Count is full here. And another walk. Well, it's hard because we expect to see Chris do the things that he did consistently in 07 and in the second half of 08, and you just don't immediately turn things on a dime and become that player when you were so low. It's a work in progress, and, and like I said, Jack Howe working on his hands. You know, they identified that what, what might be a minor problem for Chris is where his hands are. His hands were a little bit too high, making it very tough for him to get down to that low fastball, especially that down and away fastball. And he did drift a lot. His upper body was drifting, and, you know, his head movement, and he got underneath that ball quite a bit. Runners go. The throw to third is not in time. A double steal for the Diamondbacks. Mark Reynolds out front. That's 13. Chris Young right behind. That's 10. Good for them. Mike Hampton, a veteran pitcher out there, but you know, he really got himself into a pattern with one look and then go to the plate. And just a great read right there by Reynolds. Gets into third base easily. Nice slide, too, behind the tag. Well, that's a big roll of the dice in his career. Hampton holds opposing base runners to 45%. That is an incredible league average, 27%. And as you said, Candy, he's just a great athlete. Yeah, he's tough to steal second base off of because he's a lefty. He's got a very deceptive move. He can hold. He can hang a little bit. But so if you're going to steal a base on Mike Hampton, it's stealing third base. 21 times that's happened. Only six have been thrown out. Snyder to the right side. Now, Chris... Against his hometown team, you you know he's from Texas. Went to the University of Houston. He's homered three times. He's homered three times. We won't we won't you know he hasn't had the success that Chris Young has had. Two thirty six. He's homered three times. It's all right. Well, he's got uh, he's got Hampton once. 
Yes, he does. He'll take a base hit right here. High fly left field. Carlos Lee El Caballo. Now, El Caballo, a pretty good nickname in Houston. But you know how it works in Phoenix, Arizona. The best nickname, the Sheriff. And he gets it done again. Dan Heron with a couple of runs that can be dangerous no doubt about it you bet he's an all-star when you lead the league in ERA he deserves to be time now to take a look at our Cabot Woodstain's legendary performance on this date in baseball history baseball's Hall of Fame opens in Cooperstown New York and certainly a special place to visit glad to have you with us tonight and, and interactive if you could have you ever visited the baseball Hall of Fame text a for yes, B four no two seven four four nine nine. If you have it, then you're able at some point. You should. But we'd like to know how many of you have. Carlos Lee takes strike one. You couldn't throw a better first pitch. Just nails the outside corner of the fastball. Patented Danny Heron. And he does this a lot, especially the first time through the order. And then you'll start seeing him switch it up because he won't. He will not pattern himself. We talk about that a lot. He is stubborn. I mean, really stubborn. He's not going to give in to guys, and, but he's got four great pitches that he'll throw any time in any count. So that's why I mean hitters are always in between pitches. They just can't sit on a pitch on him. And that's a curveball. Two and one the count to Carlos Lee. Has played in every game this year. That's the kind of player he is. He wants to play every inning of every game. Bouncing ball out to third. Roberts off his glove. That's an error for the Diamondbacks. He got stuck in between hops on that one. A lot of top spin coming on this ground ball. The second hop he gets in between. He goes back to try to get an easier visual on that ball. But every time you retreat, it seems like when you let the ball play you, you're not going to make the play. Very upset about that, but. Carlos Lee now on first base and Danny Heron just got to go about his business and keep that guy from from scoring. So right back to work against Lance Berkman. Not your favorite thing to have occur when you have a runner reach in front of the ever dangerous switch hitters. He takes a strike. You Berkman. talk about Berkman in his career. He's up there with with the greats truly. Switch hitter, very powerful. Wow. And when he gets on a roll, he gets on a roll. I mean, you jump on this guy's back when he gets hot. And let's hope he doesn't get hot till about four days. 299 career home runs, so one shy of a magic number. With regard to switch hitters, that's seventh best all time in the history of the game. Wow. 
Boy, he just put it at bat on him, and Berkman wants to talk about it with Brian Knight. He just went three fastballs against him, and he spotted him perfectly. Look where Snyder sits up. Outside, doesn't even move his glove. Just nails it. Heron just right on his game right now. Just a perfect pitch. Sometimes hitters feel like they got cheated. He feels like he just got the bat taken out of his hands right now. That's called away. Very similar pitch. To be fair. To Jeff Blum. And he's been fair to no one. Late in games anyway. The longtime journeyman utility player. Has had back to back walk offs for these Houston Astros. It was great Berkman was saying as he takes a strike. I, I've never ever done let alone two in two days. That's Wednesday and then at Minute Maid. That's third. Look at Hunter Pence. Breathe an orange fire. That's another run run. Right another nice pitch. You know he's got fastball away. The, Comes in with the cutter right in on his hands right now. And again, Danny Heron's ahead in the count. He can throw that fastball up in his zone, or he can get, you know, that get on top of that split finger and drive it down in the dirt. He can do anything right now. Two strikes. Boy, what a protective swing. Though a good swing. But again, now that what was that? Maybe outer half? Yeah, that was that was on the outside part of the plate. But it was a lot of the play. It and had play, yes. That's how you set a hitter up right there. And he's that's also a hittable watching. fastball. It is, it, but he was also watching the at bat of Berkman. And he got called out with that outside fastball. So even if it's borderline, he's got to offer at it. Runner on the move, the throw down is a stolen base for Carlos Lee. His second of the year, though, Blum goes down on strikes. Carlos has stolen two and been caught twice. Well, Carlos is just guessing right here on a split Thank finger. He got the split yeah, finger. A great pitch by Heron. Gets the strikeout, but, you know, he definitely stole that base on Danny Heron. There's a lot of great pitchers out there that really didn't pay too much attention to the stolen base. Well, the one who pitches... In a similar manner to Danny, only because he cerebrally attacked the game that, that comes to mind for me and, and was a multiple, multiple gold glove winner was Greg Maddox. Perfect Take example. Take off. Go. Go. Dwight Gooden was the same way. Randy Johnson, left hander, looking right at him. A couple of good benders in a row, one and one the count to Jeff Kepinger. And those are all pitchers that believed in their stuff. Didn't matter if guys were in scoring position or not. He believed in their stuff and just knew that they had a good chance of getting the guy out. Bouncing ball. Picture this. Roberts gets another chance and turns it into an out. In high depth or in a regular shot, it doesn't matter. Ah, second chances. They're a beautiful thing.
Aaron has a little bit of support, and that is a good thing. Mike Hampton, he is down by a score of two to nothing. Our Brown and Brown Power Chevy dealers key to the game. Well, it's simple. Beware the pumpkin. No candy. I don't mean those orange Astros jerseys. Roberts drives that one into the right center field gap. Pence is there and he makes the play. And I don't mean the, as Lou Pinella called them, pumpkins. They're actually oranges. In the train tracks in Minute Maid Park. Lou thought those were pumpkins in the train, in the train tracks. Even though it's named Minute Maid Park. <laughs> Minute Maid, of course, the, yeah, the, the grand orange company. I don't mean either one of those. When I say beware of the pumpkin, you have been riding in that gorgeous horse-drawn, white horse-drawn carriage from the ball each and every time Dan Heron takes you out for the game. And you're riding and you're just about to arrive at a victory and bam, you turn into a pumpkin at midnight. Twice in a row. Beware of that pumpkin. You know, that's incredible thinking right there. You better beware, my friend. I mean, I'm in awe right now. <laughs> Don't confuse it with those ugly orange Hawaiian softball looking jerseys. Just make sure you bring an extra slipper. That's exactly right. <laughs> Beware of the pumpkin, or as Luke called them, pumpkins. They kept hitting them, home runs, and all those pumpkins against us. No, not that man. Or that man. I miss those jerseys. Some of the ugliest jerseys ever, huh? Tom Candiotti. <laughs> ground ball to short. And the play is made in time for the out. I'm very disappointed that you don't like those. Well, but you got to let me finish, though. You see me on the planes. You see some of the ugly shirts that I wear. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, how, look at that. Look at that. Are you kidding me? The old man wore that. When the old man pitched there, my pops, that's what they wore. That's one of your shirts you wear on the plane. Old Cocoa Beach, Florida, Ron John Surf Shop. Absolutely, but I have a collar on mine. Well, you better. You don't want to get turned in. <laughs> there are fashion police on those flights. I heard you're a deputy. <laughs> Believe me, there's a lot of police. <laughs> don't be talking about the radio booth. <laughs> one and zero, oh, the count to Felipe Lopez, and it's one and one. I got you. I like oh, when I get got, crazy. You got me good. <laughs> you had to go to the cough button. <laughs> The 1-1. One, one. Over the inside, 1-2 and two, the count. So that's all I'm saying. Just be aware of the pumpkin. Halloween's right around the corner. I was going to say, here comes Halloween. Got your blow-ups out this year? Everything. Hot shot on the breaking ball, and he turns it right around. Good night for Felipe Lopez. Two for two already. Did it on the fastball. This time he gets the breaking ball. Stays down very nice and gets it right by the diving Blum. Third base. Now we really haven't seen Lopez run at all this year. The running game really has been non-existent for him. That's well said. He's a guy that can get you 15, 20, 25 stolen bases. There is a time, yes. But you're right, we don't see it as much. That's kind of an easy gate all the time on the base pass. 0 oh, and 1 the count. I like that new camera angle from up high. It's a good peek in. He just swung at a pitch that. Probably would have hit him. That ball looked like it was going to drill. Ball's coming up. Boy. You know, again, that's we talk about being either aggressive, selective, or selective aggressive. He was aggressive right there, not worrying whether it was going to be a ball or a strike, but he wanted to swing. He was in swing mode. Got him to chase away. Good pitch, a nasty slider. I'm just 
just saying, beware of the pumpkin. Fox strikes midnight. behind Dan Heron, leading it by a score of two to nothing. He's Houston Astros. Red's my name. Baseball's my game. See? That's a good looking sign. Gobbled up and in time for the out. Todd Walsh, good to have you, my friend. Good to be here. And guys, uh, with our celebration of the... Uh Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. I want to get to our Geico quote of the game, and it's sort of old school. It's an old quote from the former head of the Hall of Fame. With all the talk of Randy Johnson the last couple of days not talking to the media here in Phoenix, and a lot of people wondering what does that mean about what hat he'll wear in the Hall of Fame. Uh, this is from Dale Petrosky, who used to be the president of the Hall of Fame. I'm going to get back to it in a second because it's a very interesting comment that he made when the Dave Winfield situation came up. A lot of people wondering what he would do. He said, history is not marketable. Our responsibility is to communicate history accurately. To date, the players have been responsible. Darren, take that one away. No, that's all right, my friend. Two outs. So the reason I bring that up is a lot of people wondering, will Randy wear a Diamondbacks hat? Will he wear a Seattle Mariners hat? A lot of conjecture over the last couple of days. Uh, if you really break it down, it's a very interesting argument. And uh, we'll do that on our next installment of our show called The 10th Inning. We have a little essay on that. But I thought this quote really says it all about the game. There are a lot of players like the late great Jim Catfish Hunter who said, I can't make up my mind, and there is no logo on his hat. And there are scores and scores of players that have done that over the years. Now to our poll question of the day, have you ever been? Have you ever visited Cooperstown, New York and the Baseball Hall of Fame? Well, that's a good question, huh? I'll never forget going there as a 13-year-old and my mom taking a day off of work and driving me to Cooperstown. Greatest day of my life as a youngster. Boy, it's such a great oh. place to you know, well, you're a collector too, so then, and you played. And played three of those Hall of Fame games there. Oh my goodness. Which were, you know, just unbelievable because you have all kinds of time to go and visit. They'll give you a quick private tour, which is just amazing. Some of the stuff you see in the archives that aren't even displayed, just incredible. Pitch in on 0-2, good pitch, and look at that reaction. He looks out to <laughs> Heron on the mound as if to say, Are you kidding me with this? He has swung at a curveball in the dirt. The cut fastball has shattered his bat. He's pitched him away that he can't catch up with his fastball. Talk about a guy in between pitches. He doesn't want to hit right now. I mean, you, and as a pitcher, you get a you get a facial expression like that, you know you're in control. So he throws him a split-fingered fastball that dives away. Now remember, he threw him everything in the first at bat, but got him with the fastball in to pop up. The one two. Breaking ball down and in. Just putting on a clinic, folks. Has guys breaking bats, slamming bats. The one thing is, they're not really using their bats.
Fox Sports Arizona presents Diamondbacks Baseball, brought to you by APS, the official power partner of the Diamondbacks, and by Southwest Airlines. They're ready when you are. Go to southwest.com, grab your bag, it is on. Very special guest up here, Rob Gerritsen, joins us up here in the booth. Autism First, right there, a fabulous organization. And uh, Rob, passionate about this game, no doubt about it, folks, and has taken his love for this game and his compassion for autism because of his family and uh, has begun raising funds for what, Rob? Uh, Autism First basically is a fund to help housing for autism adults with severe autism. And we're working in conjunction with SARC, as well as you do. Yes. Um, Great organization, as you know. And we're working with them to to help raise funds to... uh, get housing for for these adults with severe autism and it's your family that's your inspiration correct very correct very correct yes as uh just get up just to get a yeah. single there just up to win. see he's he's not just here to promote the charity folks this is a guy that's passionate about this game no I'm, doubt I'm, I'm telling you but again uh, uh, about your family and its inspiration for this uh, it's tr- very true uh my oldest daughter was born almost three months premature and uh She's behind us. She's 18 now. Just graduated high school. Uh, my uh, other daughter passed away at 11 of Rett syndrome. We had discussed that before. And uh, my son is 13, be 14 this year, and has severe autism. Um, he can't talk or anything like that, but is a very smart, intelligent child. So you're out front, though. You're thinking for these folks, when they become adults, I'd like to have a place for them to go. And Tom Candiotti, I know uh, you love collecting. You love collectibles. Um, he takes this whole concept, and that's really where you generate a lot of your funds, correct? That's basically where we get all of our funds, actually, is, is through uh, donations and everything. We happen to have a, a, a very good auction going on right now. You can go to uh, autismfirst.org and uh, look at the different things that we have listed there. That will take you straight to our uh, eBay auction. And right now, pretty much everything we've got, we're splitting with the Daredevil Diamondback Foundation 50-50. Uh, that's great. Oh, that's nice. You know. I mean, I got a couple of jerseys you could have. I'm, I'll take them. Yeah. See, there I'll we go. Them. You won't get hey. more than a dollar for you, them. You, <laughs> you, know? you know what? I, I don't turn down nothing but the sheets on my bed, and sometimes I don't turn them down, Tom. So I'll take whatever you got. You got it. Yeah, this is, I appreciate uh, it. Thank you, sir. This is a great work you're doing. Rob, of course, an integral part of the community in that area. Upton with a leadoff single. 2-0 and oh, the count to Stephen Drew. On the ah. line, will they get two? Yes, they do, unfortunately. Ah. Upton saying, I got Jeez. back onto the bag. He was there, Darren. Let's see. Tom, you tell us. You know, it certainly looked like he got back, and judging by the way Upton is, is arguing, he feels that he got back. This ball was just corked by Drew, just a line shot, and the throw back over to first base, and he yeah. was gliding in there, but it certainly looked like he got his hand in there. Mm-hmm. See from a different angle. Upton's in there. I mean, it's a bang-bang play right there, but Todd goes to the runner, right? Let's see here. This will be the definitive angle. Very close. Boy, how do you even call that? Well, here's the rule that we live by up here, Rob and and, and Candyman. To me, on the TV side, if we have to show you three and four angles and slow it down more and more, there's no wrong call. That's kind of the rule. Am I off base, Candy, with that? No, not at all. But, you know, I take it one step farther. I look to see if they call them out, they have to see them out. To me. Okay. Even even at first base, you have to see him out. Otherwise, you're safe. And I didn't see him out there. So Justin Upton is out, heads back to the dugout. Two away, two to nothing, the score. And that one a pop up to the right side. So folks can visit your website, autismfirst.org, if they'd like to make correct. a donation. If they want to donate items, correct? Maybe absolutely. They're, maybe they're collectors and they want to get into the mix with this. Is a- that correct? Ab- absolutely. Um, we have a very good foundation with the, the Arizona Diamondbacks. But I'll be honest, you know, the Phoenix Suns and the, uh, the Cardinals... I could use some help, guys. All right. All right. You going know, down the gauntlet. But I'm just, just going to throw it out there. But even parents and, and, and oh, folks absolutely. That, where it touches anybody, their heart. Anybody. Um, and, and, and by all means, if you have questions, concerns, anything like that, feel free to contact us. And if we can't help you, we will try to find you somebody that can. Now, that's wonderful. Rob Gerritsen joining us up here. Two to nothing the score. His group is autism first and. Something obviously you know we we deal with in 
raise funds for Sark and uh, Sutton Sorks, the little folks and you folks out there in the community have been so supportive as that one drops in there. Two and two of the count. The website autismfirst.org. Now, you, of course, a Diamondbacks fan, but who was your original team? Who was your big baseball team when you were young? When I was young, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. So, St. Louis Cardinals, Joe Garagiola Sr. Ooh, very good. I've known him since 1982. Joe Garagiola That's Sr. That's awesome. He's a great guy. A, a, a fantastic man. Well, Joe called us yesterday, and, and Rob and folks and Candy, and had some thoughts on bad ball hitters. We had a bad ball and Pablo Sandoval hitter in town. And Joe mm -hmm. had some great comparisons to Yogi Berra. Hot shot. That's a fair ball. Mark Reynolds is on the move. Picked on a pitch that was in. Well, Mark Reynolds now, not just one, but two doubles tonight. So he is in scoring position for Chris Young. We'll see this again. First time up, Reynolds goes the opposite way. Hampton realized that. He goes, you know what? I'm going to pitch this guy in. What's Reynolds do? He's quick to the ball and just nails it right inside the third base bag and ends up going down the line. That's a hitter making some adjustments. Well, in the same day that he opened up the morning edition and probably wanted to use it as fish wrap, no offense, because the article was about him on pace to set the strikeout record again. Can't always uh, study the numbers too much. I love what he has to say, though. When you when you think about Mark Candy, man, he is becoming more and more at peace with who he is. He is. He's learning to, you know, what his limitations are. He's developing into a type of player that he wants to be. Instead of looking at his negative statistics all the time, you look at his RBIs, look at his stolen bases. You know, his batting average is up there. His on base percentage is up there. There are so many great stats that are working for Mark Reynolds. Chris Young was out today, and something you'd be proud of, Rob. He was out visiting a, a local community hospital and giving his time back to the community. Very nice, yes. I, I, I love it when anybody does something like that for the community. Okay. Anything for, for children and senior citizens, I am all behind 100%. I'm behind any charity. I mean, don't get <laughs> me wrong, but I, I like to work with, you know, children and seniors. Two and one to count to see why. Those hands keep dropping a little further down, don't they, Candy? And they're starting to stay down. That one is belted mm -hmm. to the left center field gap. It goes. Rolls all the way to the wall. He walked in his first at bat. He races on around for a two-base hit. Doubles in the back-to-back -back variety. And the Diamondbacks lead it three to nothing. And with runners in scoring position. That's right. That number's going up. You said that with two outs. There you go. It was 40. That's right. Look where the location of the pitch is. He turns it over. It's on the outside part of the plate. Look at his hands. His hands aren't up here anymore. They're down a little bit lower. Now he can get to that ball, and he gets to it with ease and drives it very hard out the left center field. So the Houstonian torches his hometown team, as we said, as Snyder takes a breaking ball for a strike. Chris Young came in. Hitting 375 against the Astros in his career and slugging nearly 700. Maybe it is just a uniform. Not that nappy old orange one that Candy doesn't like. <laughs> the rainbow, the sunset rainbow. That pitches away. Now, Rob, you have to like those old Astros uniforms, right? If they're in, if when, they're Nolan, in when Nolan Ryan was in it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If yeah. they were in his option, it, he'd really like them. Well, absolutely. Well, he'd look good in overalls. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Nolan would look good in overalls. We know that, the well, way he pitched. So a candy are you. Yeah, let's not push it. <laughs> to the middle of the diamond, you are doing good work, my friend. It is Autism First, and we were honored to have you as our guest. Thank Keep you so up, much for okay? having us. Rob Great. Garrett, thank you, yes, Autism thank First. Thank you so much, we'll find I appreciate it.
four that is the best pitch in a strikeout. Absolutely. It's all about the setup pitch. We just look at the final result too much. Splitter down in the dirt. What do you do? You come back and a splitter away, fastball away, paints him, comes right back. He doubles up on it. We love them doubling up. A fastball away, an emergency swing, splitter down and in, splitter away. Watch this hook. Boom. You're not going to hit that. I mean, just a great combination of pitches, and that's all about setting up a hitter. Very good way to take a look at the strikeouts thus far for Dan Hare. Miguel Tejada in. That was what Dan will tell you, an ugly pitch, but at net strike one, a chest-high, split-fingered fastball. And Tejada, again, this guy is an aggressive hitter. You know that as a pitcher. You do the numbers before the game. He's got six walks this year. He's up there hacking. You don't have to throw the ball over the middle of the plate. You get away with bad pitches on this guy. Bouncing ball to the right side. Reynolds is in no man's land, so Heron has to get to the bag. And he does in time for the out. And Miguel barks out some anger as he is erased on a ground ball out. Right fielder, Glad to have Aflac. our Aflac duck back on the Hall of Fame birthday. Name the first five players to be inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Is it? You don't know that one? See that we got Walter Johnson. We got Babe Ruth. Cut fastball, strike one. We got Ty Cobb. Now you've got three. We got Christy Matthewson. You've got four. And we got Honus Wagner. All right. Tom Candiotti. And the pitch. <laughs> Bouncing ball. Charges. Gobbles it up. What a play. And again, the second opportunities that you get. Had an error on what he would tell you was a more routine play. That's not routine at all. Boy, not an easy play at all. But, you know, this guy stays fired up. He's an emotional player. You know, it, nothing makes an infielder more mad is, is when you don't play good defense out there. And he wants, you know, revenge for that error that he made before. He comes in, makes a nice play on the run, nice transfer, strong throw right to Reynolds. I mean, great, great play. So now Carlos Lee reached on that error. He was the one that was with a bat in his hands when Roberts had the miscue. You know, Darren, we make a lot of things of, about hair and how tough he is to hit. Sometimes we forget to mention what that great hesitation in his windup does. Yeah. What does it do? It throws the timing on. The hitters are up there. Hitting is all about timing. And your job as a pitcher is to go out there and upset timing all you can. And he does it with that hesitation. It gets guys out in front. They're not used to seeing that with normal guys. What a great piece of pitching there. He just went in right up under that goatee for a ball. I mean, right up by his helmet. And then the next pitch in, but for a strike. Yeah. You know, hitters like to get out. I mean, you have that hesitation out there, along with his stuff, obviously. But it's hard to stay back. The one two. Cut fastball. Has to protect. Lee went over 1,000 RBIs at the end of last season. He very quietly, for a lot, he makes a nice living, but he very quietly among sluggers has had a very solid offensive career. Drove in 100 last year, 119 the year before. You know, also, you watch Carlos Lee. You know, we, we talked about, you know, hand position on a bat. Carlos Lee, his bottom hand, his pinky finger is on the bottom of the bat. It's on the bottom of the barrel. It's not even on the bat. Almost like Julio Franco used to do. So you talk about differences of guys choking up. He belts that one deep left field. Parr going back to the wall, and it's gone. Just got over that yellow line. Fan reached, but I don't think far enough over to make a difference. A home run for Carlos Lee. RBI number 40, home run number 11 for a guy that finds ways to drive in runs. That's the 11th home run that Danny Heron has given up. But again, Carlos Lee likes to extend his arms. Fastball on the outside third of the plate. Not a bad pitch at all, but he yeah. goes out there. Not only yeah. does he get it, but he almost hooks that ball. 
a ball that he should probably want to take the right center field. He ends up pulling it and still gets it out of the ballpark. Sometimes as a pitcher, every mistake pitch that you throw doesn't get hit all the time. That was a breaking ball, a rocket shot for Berkman. And so back to back swats for the Houston Astros. And that's a good point. You have a big guy, got a lot of plate coverage. You know what? Tom Candiotti, you talk about pitches in a sequence we just showed you strike twos and then strike threes or the pitches for the strikeouts. I'm going to say that the pitch that he fouled off to protect a power hitter, a cutter away, just ticked it. Then he hit the next pitch out. I mean, you think about hanging in there like that. For a free swinger that strikes out a ton, which he doesn't, that's usually strike three, that pitch right there. Yeah, usually after that pitch away, they're probably looking for something in the dirt, a curveball, a split. You know, but he stayed back, and you know, he just saw the ball. We talk about hitters have to see the ball, and that's what he did. He saw the ball and didn't miss it. You want to know an intelligent hitter? Look at Lance Berkman. First time up, three heaters. Strike three on a borderline pitch away. So Heron comes after him. First pitch this at bat with a breaking ball, and he leans on it for a base hit. Which means he's thinking about what he's doing up there. Exactly. He's thinking along with Heron because if you're Heron, you're going, I'm not going to throw this guy a fastball right now. I've already thrown him three. I'm going to come with something off speed, and he just drills it. It's a thinking hitter. That's a little cat mouse game that goes on. And by the way, the next move is Dan Harris and be ready for him to make a move. Didn't mean to. Let's see if he can pounce on it. He does. He shoots it. On across. El Caballo, the horse. Hop on my back. The boys from Houston, Texas tonight. We ride. Or Aflac trivia question, which the uh, the guru already answered. I had all their baseball cards. Aflac. Ty Cobb, Walter Johnson, Christy Matthewson, Babe Ruth, Ruth, and Hannes Wagner. That one is high and away. Now the order that they went in with regard to the votes they received: Cobb was number one, Ruth was number two, Wagner three, Matthewson, and then Walter Johnson. Two things that are stunning there. The Babe Ruth was second in the total voting. Number two, they really didn't value pitching as much in that first class. They were four and five. I guess we'll let a couple of guys in. Play is made, broken bat. And don't forget the, the big hitting inning. D 
D-backs hit and win. Gila River Casinos hit the sign. And one lucky fan watching on Fox Sports Arizona will win $340,000 if those signs get hit. It jumps up ten grand every time. KC Dickinson, best of luck. Visit dbacks.com slash hit and win or winhila.com, winhilariver.com. Well, these guys can hit these pitchers. Now, Mike Hampton has had a Hall of Fame career as a pitcher with a bat in his hand, but this year they're doing it again. Dan Heron this year has seven hits. That's second in the National League to Mike Hampton, who has eight. Three RBIs for Heron. That's fourth to Hampton's four. He is second. They're both slugging, interestingly enough. As that one is in. But Mike Hampton, really regarded and deservedly so, as one of the best hitting pitchers of all time. Is that a stretch? Yeah, no, not at all, especially with his power. He's a good athlete all the way around. Great athlete. Sometime this year, Heron will go deep. Okay. Now, Mike Hampton has 15 home runs. He had a season in 01 in which he had seven home runs. Topper. Not going deep that time. Good pitch. Pitched him like a hitter. You know, it's funny when that happens. Taking a look ahead at the rest of our series. Roy Oswalt not having a Roy Oswalt like year. He will be back on the mound tomorrow night, John Garland. Then it's Brian Moeller against Billy Buckner on Sunday. We'll hear uh, as Miller Light brings you what's been. We'll hear a lot from Roy Oswalt during the telecast tomorrow. His views on pitching, his perspective. Fun to watch him work. And he will work against John Garland. And Billy Buckner will go on Sunday. Kind of a bulldog, Oswalt, isn't he? He is. Yeah, he's a tough guy. He's a guy who reminds me a lot of, of Jack Morris. I had a long conversation with Jack Morris, great pitcher for the Tigers and Twins and Blue Jays. And he said, My goal was to go out there and outpitch the other guy. I don't care if I have to win 10 to 9 or 1 to nothing or if I have to pitch 15 innings. I said, My goal is to outpitch the guy I'm pitching against. And that kind of reminds me of, of Roy Oswald. That kind of bulldog mentality. Very funny you said that. I mean, literally, and we'll, we're going to edit all the interview that, that I had with him today. Almost to the word, that is what he said. Is that right? And, and it was more tied to, we've kind of had a theme here on the TV side about pitching deep into games and how it's a mindset. A.J. Hinch was talking about it. Nolan Ryan has turned things a bit in Houston, or I should say he... In Texas and Dallas with the Astros. Or with the all right, with the Rangers. We got it. I pitch for the Astros. Anyway. AJ talking about that it's it's a mindset. And sometimes a manager has to help a pitcher find that mindset. And if he finds it, he has to let him go. He has to trust the pitcher. And I asked Roy Oswald about that, about pitching deep into games. He said the bottom line is I just need to pitch deeper than my opponent. If I pitch deeper into the game than my opponent, I've got a good chance of winning. You've got a better chance of winning than he does. That's exactly right. I love that mentality. And let's watch tonight. I mean, let's watch to see. Dan Heron has had a couple of bumps in the road, no doubt. Not with his own pitching, but his teammates. And he's thrown 106 pitches his last outing. And 110, will he maybe push himself to pitch the eighth? Pitch deeper. We'll see. It's been great tonight. Nolan Ryan, the Astros, Rangers, Rangers, and the Astros, Texas, and Houston, <laughs> Arlington, and Houston. I got a great story I'd love to share. If, if, if this at bat doesn't end on this pitch, I'll, I'll break it out real quick. It involves your dad. Uh oh. When I was pitching for the Brewers, we were teammates way back in 1983. And one game I went seven innings and came out with the lead. We were winning three to one. Reliever had to come in. Pete Ladd Remember? saved the game. Sasquatch. <laughs> and I was pretty happy afterwards. You know, I won my third game in a row, and your dad came up to me. That one is lined in the left field. It's a base hit for Parra. A runner on. Like that better than the bunt, quite frankly. Base hit for Parra continues, sir. So the next day at the park, and your dad says, I want to talk to you. So we go down to the dugout, and uh, it was great. Those days, veterans always wanted to help. 
young guys out and you know make them you know better pitchers. And he said, uh, "What would you feel about your performance yesterday?" Yeah, it's pretty good. You know, I went seven innings and five or six hits or something like that. Won the game. But he goes, "Wasn't a good outing." He goes, "You let the starting pitcher today down by coming out after seven innings and not going deeper into the game." Now, the closer can't pitch. Now, this is when they had two inning closers. Sure, stuff. sure, sure. And I thought about that in the longest time, and I said, "Well, I, I could have pitched another inning." I mean, that's that was the mentality back then compared to now when, where guys are looking at the pitch count. They're looking at um, at the innings. They go, okay, it's seven inning. You know, they're like a battery. You keep recharging it after seven or after so much. It's, it only gets used to going so far. That's a great story. So that was, that was not a good outing. And then as my career developed, I always had a rapport with the manager, and the manager would never come out and take me out of the game you know, unless I'm doing bad because of, of getting tired, unless I gave him the sign. Right. All the starting pitchers had a sign with the manager, whether it was a pick when you're getting tired. So he doesn't have to ask you, are you tired? Have you hit a wall? You told him. Now that's a more veteran pitcher, right? Yes. Because let's be honest. I mean, yes. a young pitcher probably wouldn't be honest. You know, and, and well, say, not I'm a, good, not I you. can stay in the game, and I'm good with no sign or picking of the jersey. Yeah, and a lot of guys are, are like that. You, you want to stay out there, but it helps you compete against the guy that you're throwing against, the opposing pitcher. I'm not coming out of the game until I pitch better than that guy. Two and two the count. It's good stuff to Justin Upton. My goodness, all that deep wisdom. He just used to tell me to take out the trash. <laughs> he didn't know he was oh, so smart, hey. right? <laughs> Smokes. <laughs> do it to the count. Not interested. That's the other thing that goes with a guy like Upton now. The discipline that he's showing. It's amazing because the pitchers are pitching Justin Upton differently than other guys. If you're getting the guys in front of you out with fastballs, you're going to throw breaking balls to Justin or vice versa. You, know, you just, a guy like that, a guy like Barry Bonds, a guy, it, you just pitch him differently than everybody else. And he makes those adjustments. So the bases are now full. He pitched very carefully to Upton. And there's nowhere to put Stephen Drew. They're saying Drew back in the days of the aforementioned Milwaukee. They used to say Coop when that man got into the box. Cecil Cooper. They're loaded up, as you can see, with Lopez, Para, and Upton. But boy, Cecil Cooper could hit. Talk about an opposite field line drive hitter. Kind of what he's been doing right now from that left side of the box. 0 and 1. Swinging it back, great. Already hit that line drive, unfortunately. He was caught by the second baseman, his last at bat. But he's getting locked in. Boy, dangerous pitch. Left that right where he did not want to be in and in the hitting zone. He had that at one point. He could start the ball there, and that ball would dive and dive hard. Now it just kind of rolls, and it doesn't quite have that velocity. You know, that old velo, as we call it, oh, was there up it in is. The, the low 90s, 92, 91 with hard sink. It's not there anymore. Houston, we have velo. That one is outside. One and two, the count. Walked and scored in the first. Line to second in the third. Now, young lady, he's looking to drive in three. Two and two. Just can't locate. This, by the way, is uh, we're kind of on the outside of the party, but we're glad to have our own party looking in. This is an interleague weekend. Yeah, except for us, right? And this is the outside. 16 teams in the National League, 14 in the American League. The 2-2. Two -two. Broke his back. It's rolled out to seven. And in time for the out. They leave him loaded, so the lead is just two.
Bucks having fun out there. Visited by Justin Upton yesterday. He dropped a depth charge in there. Yes, he did. As that one is away, one and zero. The count to Jeff Keppinger. Amazing, Keppinger with the guard way almost up to his knee. Look at him on, on his left leg. That's usually down on the ankle, right around the ankle area. Look, this is that. He that is way up there. He must have caught one on the bottom of the knee. Ah, Barty Armor. What are your thoughts on body armor? Are you okay? Are you are you that old school that you don't like it? I don't like the elbow guards and any of that stuff. If you guard the ankle, that's fine. Ty Cobb didn't have it, right? No, I don't think so. <laughs> There's a strike. Yeah, that's that's probably protecting what is a, a pretty deep bruise at some point. Probably fouled it off, but well, there's a great Astro. Honestly, a very favorite player of mine to cover. It doesn't play anymore. Will be a Hall of Famer. Craig Biggio used to protect himself pretty good. Yeah, as soon as he got that body armor on, that all the way up that left elbow, he dove every single time. Yes, he did. Go ahead and hit me. Hit that body armor. Hit my Darth Vader. I'll go to first base and steal second. Number one all time in being hit by pitches. And didn't get hurt. Kepinger draws a walk. Dan Heron kicking himself there. Lost him with a breaking ball. Dan really doesn't walk anyone. I mean, coming into the ball game today, he had pitched 85 innings. He had struck out 83, so about one for every inning. He's walked 11 this year. Yeah, and for him on a pitch like that, you don't really question his pitch selection because no, he could throw any pitch at any time. He just didn't execute the pitches all. It's execution. Yeah. So, you know, he's one guy that you just don't second guess his pitch selection. He is as prepared as anybody in baseball of what he wants to do in any situation. Umberto Quintero, and he takes a strike. The numbers for Dan Heron. And hard to argue with any of these. Those are all star numbers, though he is four and four. I think Charlie Manuel would be hard pressed if he were to have to build his team tomorrow to leave him off. There are many pitchers with more wins, but no one with a better ERA. Good pitch, fastball called in. I will make a personal call to Charlie Manuel if he gets left off, believe me. You'll play that card. Oh, yeah. All right. Me and Charlie go back. Use uh, use a landline. I'd like to, to grab another receiver and listen in. That'd be a fun conversation. You can, you can, we'll have a three way. <laughs> Fires it over to first. And you know, and he's, he's one of the great. Guys in baseball, he's he's so fun to talk to. Got time for everybody. The one-one bouncing ball. Is there two in this one? You bet. There's a double play. Catcher running, take advantage. A good pitcher about to hit. Boy, just kind of. Hits that ball the other way, right where Lopez, who was pitcher anticipating right where he's going to hit the ball. Infielders do that when you got a pitcher with command out there. Picture perfect. Well, that's the other part of that we don't talk about a lot is you get a few more plays, not only if you throw strikes, not only if you work quickly. As that breaking ball drops in there. But if you're a second baseman and you see a sign for a pitch away, and you believe that he's going to get it there, you'll cheat, just like you said. Yeah, and you're ready to move that way. You're ready to move the opposite way. Cal Ripken was just phenomenal of doing that when he was with the Baltimore Orioles, playing shortstop. And it was just amazing. The guy didn't have the greatest range. He didn't have the greatest speed. But he always made the plays. He seemed like he was always in the right place at the right time. Hampton to center field. Young runs it down. We told you he could hit. You better play him like a hitter. He is a hitter.
We're going to bring in another Southpaw as one warms out on the mound and Mike Hampton. Greg Swindell, part of our pregame and postgame coverage. Zeke, good to have you. I have another longtime Major League pitcher, Tom Candiotti. Here's the discussion. You guys ready? <laughs> yes, sir. In 1999, the man on the mound, Mike Hampton, had an incredible year. He won 22 games. His team won 97. Right. And they, in fact, went to the playoffs after winning 97. He had a great ERA of 2.90. And his team, well, they did big things. He did not win the Cy Young. <laughs> he finished second to a man who won 17 games. Had an ERA about a half run better. Five wins, the difference, though. And so my question for you, Mr. Swindell, is, as his teammate that year, why did Randy Johnson, hands down, as that one is slapped into left field by Reynolds, is he looking for double number three? Heading into second, it is. Three doubles for Mark Reynolds. Very nice. Why, why did he win? Hands down. That's Why did he win hands over down? a guy who won 22 games? Well, exactly. I mean, Mike Camp, you never know what happened to Randy during the, a few of those wins. Uh, me being in the bullpen probably could have given one up or, okay. or somebody else could have given one Fair up. Fair enough. But if you look at it, the 364 strikeouts, 2.48 ERA, his team also went to the playoffs. So I think in, in that year, Randy's numbers, besides the wins, are just, are, I mean, more dominating than, than, than Mike Campton's that year. Plus, Jose Lima could have taken some of his votes being a teammate of Mike Campton in, in Houston that year. Very good stuff. There is also the discussion, Tom Candiotti, of the utter domination of Randy that year in the sense that complete games. Hampton was good in today's standards. He had three complete games. Randy Johnson had 12 that year. Well, Greg said it. It's domination. When Randy took them out, it was like almost a no-hitter every single time. Yeah. Hampton's a great pitcher, and he won a lot of games, but you probably don't remember a lot of his games, And but you look at his overall numbers at the end of the year, you go, wow, this guy had a great year. But every time Randy took them out, you were almost thinking a no-hitter probably. And you got 364 strikeouts. That's unheard of. I mean, until Kurt came here, and they, I think they both had 300 one year, um, the strikeouts just aren't there. That's dominating games when you're striking out that many hitters. And, and I think he, he, his hits that year were also um, less than the, he had 270-something innings and only 206 hits. That's I mean, exactly I mean right. that, that's incredible. Less hits and more innings than Mike Hampton and uh, just more dominating stats other than the win column. And I think the thought is that this was a team that was born in 1998, and in 1999 they were playing in October. Do you think that swayed the voters? Uh, I, I think the voters saw what Randy did. I mean, I, I saw it every start that year. Um, I, I definitely would have voted for him if I had a vote, but um, the guy, the dominance, the, the, the overpowering stuff that he had during not only that year, but he went on to win four straight after that. So the, just the total domination of Randy Johnson. Candy, this brings us to the second part of the discussion. Dan Heron is pitching tonight. He has four wins. Four. He leads the National League in ERA. Do we make too much now in the day and age where we understand stats better? Things like complete games. Things like whip. Walks and hits per innings pitch in which he leads. Where I know you guys want to win, especially starters. But those that cover the game and vote on the game probably don't need to make a big deal out of wins. Is that correct? Well, well sometimes as a starting pitcher, you don't have control over whether you win or loss. When your defense comes into play, your offense, your run support, I don't know what Randy's run support was that year, but it, it might have been pretty low. I, I mean, I don't know, but, you know, there's a lot of other things that come into play that a pitcher, starting pitcher, doesn't have control over wins. But you do have control over your walks. You have control over whether you strike guys out, hits that you give up. And that's why we look at whip a lot, because it's a pretty good indicator of, of how effective a pitcher is. You know, Candy and I were, were teammates in Cleveland back in the, the mid to, to late 80s, and, and we always used to kid each other because Candy would go out and get nine runs, and I would go out and get one run uh, of, of support. <laughs> and so we, it was just kind of an ongoing joke that we had going, you know, it's not when, how you pitch, it's when you pitch. But but there were, the days did turn around where I got more runs than than, um, than Candy did. And here, here's a look. And this is not at all to knock down talented pitchers like Billingsley, Kane, Marquine, and Santana. But these guys have eight wins, twice as many as Dan Heron. Twice as many. But we've watched it. I mean, yeah, absolutely. We, we've watched. He's, he's been uh, Randy Johnson-esque, I guess, I guess, this year as far as um, dominating games. And But the thing is, and, it, and I've heard you all talk about it tonight, is the complete game and, and getting deep into games. I mean, he, ha he has gotten into the seventh and eighth inning a, a couple times, but um, I think – would you have 15 one year, Candy? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's that's going deep in the games. You want to start, finish what you start, and Dan Heron's going to have to start doing that the rest of the way out. Greg Swindell joining us up here in the booth along with Tom Candiotti and I. 
these guys are going to talk more about Dan Heron's season. I know, and in, in, in the post game show as well, you'll be the analyst on that. Yes. You enjoying it? I am. I mean, it, it, you know, when I first came back, it, it was a little, you know, you got used to the cameras and the angles and and the dress code. Right, <laughs> they, they, right. they slap the dress code on me now. You better play by the rules. Still wearing now. your Claiborne, I see. Yeah, triangles. I want it from you. We used to, we used to have bets too. Uh, was it golf? We'd have so golf. Imagine that. Candy, oh, oh, candy if, if he won, I got him a shirt. Or not the ones he wears now, though. And and if I won, we it was it was a kind of an ongoing clothing bet that we had. The Longhorns in the College World Series. Congratulations. Oh, you had to bring that up, huh? Yeah, I'm fired up about it. I'm, I'm really fired up that, that if they win and, and Arizona State wins, they will play each other on, on Tuesday night. All and right. I got to fly it out at 9 o'clock Sunday morning, so I will be in Omaha watching the Longhorns this weekend. What was that Beach Boys song? Be true to your school? Hey, I, I think if you cut me right now, Orange would come My out. My goodness. <laughs> Football team going to be any good this fall? Oh, they're ranked, ranked second or third coming out, I think. Come on. Uh-huh. Colt McCoy's back for his 12th year. All right. <laughs> no, they're going to be very good. I, I'm excited about that, too. I mean, they didn't lose very much from last year, and the maturity that, that Colt has shown over the last couple of years, and now his, his final year. At the University of Texas, um, I think he'll be back in New York accepting the trophy this year. Now, this is interesting. We'll let him help us analyze for the rest of the sitting. We'll put the, the debate to bed. It seems like kind of a of a no-brainer. The other thing, guys, just to close the book on it, unless you'd like to go deeper, the run support that year. Randy got 5.1 runs per game. Hampton got 6.9 runs per game. There was only one game, one game the entire year that Hampton in which he pitched in which he received fewer than two runs of support. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt Mike Hampton had a great year and, great got, year. and got some run support. But unfortunately, he ran into to a, a bus haul with Rand, Randy Johnson that year. I mean, I mean, the run support, when you're striking out 370 hitters and you have a 2-3 ERA, you don't need much run support to win games. But uh, I think some of those games, uh, Randy... Uh, came out and, and we just I, mean, I think I remember one of those games he struck out 20 went nine innings and it went extra innings and he didn't get the win. Didn't get the win. <laughs> yeah. yeah Randy had seven games in which he received fewer than two runs. Yeah. And I bet he had a lot of innings pitched. Oh yeah absolutely. 270. 271. Yeah. Hampton 239. I mean, I had 242 a career high. I mean, that's that's an, an every year thing for Randy Johnson. So it's the beginning, I think, guys, of what has been going on for a lot of people that really love this game for the last decade that are deep thinkers. And I consider myself way behind that of kind of rethinking how you view the game. You want to win if you're a pitcher. And wins mean a lot, but who had the better year? I mean, right now, who's having a better year than Dan here? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> so I, I mean, not not me. There might be a couple out there, but, but as far as we've watched him every game, you've sat up here and watched him every game. I've I've sat at home and watched him. Sat here and watched him. Uh, there's there's no better pitcher out there right now. Yeah, especially when you look at, at personal statistics. You look at his, his statistics. No one's going to put any better statistics than that. But you know, there's times where you got to go out there, and this could have happened with Randy, where your team needed that win. You needed a guy to go out there and complete the game and get the win, not leave it up to the bullpen and. And Randy might have been that guy. Well, it was, it was almost at a point. I mean, me being a lefty and Randy being a lefty, there wasn't many times I came in after Randy to pitch. Right. Because, I mean, what was what could I do in the eighth inning that Randy couldn't couldn't do? <laughs> and and um, he was going to finish the game. You knew you had a day off that day pretty much. And those complete games, this is where, you know, we talk about the, the – it's not modern day. That was, what, ten years ago. But the newer pitcher, the newer age pitcher – and A.J. was talking about it being a mindset, the complete game. This is where the complete game, you just control things. I mean, if you're Danny, you just, if you're able, if you're physically able, it's just in your hands. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I think it starts in the minor leagues. They, they must not let them finish many games in the minor leagues. I mean, when I took the ball, I wanted to finish the thing. I, I did in college. I did uh, when I got to Cleveland and, and for my whole career until I became a relief pitcher. That's what you want to do. You want to finish what you start. And, and I'm sure looking back now, Dan Heron might have wanted that in a couple of these games. But um, unfortunately, things <laughs> things turned for him. But uh, he, he's definitely got what it takes to, to finish ball games. Yeah, don't be satisfied till you get the 27th out. Mm-hmm. Just keep that mindset when you go out there. Broken bat, middle of the diamond. The play is made by the shortstop, Tejada. It's a fine one. Greg Swindell, thank you for your insights, yes, my friend. Thank you. Southpaw. We'll hear him on the post game show.
Sunrise and Sidekicks. One of the counselors at that camp is Megan Feller. She joins me here. She's hanging out at the game. But Megan, you, you were a camper at one point, right? Yes. Um, I've been coming to the camp ever since I was eight years old, so I'm on my 15th year straight. I haven't missed a summer yet. And you are a cancer survivor. Yes, yeah, I am. I was diagnosed when I was two and a half years old. So what do you think that camp meant to you at that point in your life when you were a young girl? Um, you know, I didn't really remember having the cancer, but I remember that feeling of welcomeness, and I remember just how incredible everybody was, how they made me feel. I always came back not just for the activities, but for the people, because everyone there is just wonderful. What do you see in the eyes of the children that are there now? I see a lot of hope. I see a lot of people who are um, they are just excited to be there. All the kids just love that experience where... They want that opportunity to be kids. They don't want to be cancer patients. They want to have some fun and just enjoy life for a little bit. So if someone's watching and they want to get their family member involved, how would they do it, Megan? Um, they would probably want to do that by contacting uh, Barb Nicholas with the American Cancer Society. That's who sponsors Arizona Camp Sunrise and Sidekicks. Um, we're always welcoming counselors, and they'll have a blast. Everybody who I work with is fantastic. I think I can say this for anyone watching at home, guys. I think you might concur. You just look like the perfect counselor with the perfect attitude. So whoever's at that camp, for whatever reason, Megan, they're uh, they're very lucky. Thanks for joining us. Hope everyone's having a good time out here tonight. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. All right, guys, just another note. American Cancer Awareness Night here. So for Solomon Morris, we're thinking about you, buddy. Great stuff, Todd. Thank you very much. And a lot of uh, good, caring folks here tonight. Some good baseball tonight as well. Slap the other way. So he'll do it again. That's when he gets it going when he's slapping the ball like that. Yeah, he's trying to hit the ball to the ground. He's going to try to use his legs. He's had you know, a couple miserable at bats against Heron, where he's, Heron's really had his way with him. Back to the screen it goes. Just got to keep him off base because he can fly. Look for him right now, Aaron, to come back down and in with that curveball. Struck him out last time with that hook down and in. Look for that same pitch. And he did. Yeah, just got it up a little bit too high. If he drops that down where that ball's about dirt high, he probably swings over the top of that one. I mean, Bourne, he's really trying to figure Aaron out, and he just can't do it right now. <laughs> he's trying to guess with him. It doesn't matter. I mean, you can still guess right with a pitcher like Heron, but still, even though a, a hitter knows that that pitch is coming, if you put it with good stuff in a great location, you still got a great chance to get him out. Curve ball misses away, two and two the count. Pitch selection sometimes isn't as key as pitch location. Right. Slap foul. Let's bring Todd back in for one more second. Todd. Guys, I just want you to see. You know, we're talking about going to the Hall of Fame as a kid. He, he doesn't want to talk on camera, but I hope you see Joshua, seven years old, pounding his ice cream with the Diamondbacks batting helmet cup. I, I just had a flashback to when I was seven. Oh, I was just that was eating great. and watching. I just wanted to share that with you. This is this is baseball. Yep. Thanks, Joshua. He, does, he doesn't cup. want to talk. No. That's uh, ice cream. <laughs> Neapolitan looks good. I think Todd's eyeballing his ice cream. <laughs> uh, yeah. That split finger fastball <laughs> dives away. Memories, the old plastic helmet where you'd either put it on your head from the giveaway, the big one, or the one that you had the ice cream in. Breaking ball is high, and he loses Bourne. Be careful. And he tried to throw that curveball three and two, and. You know, that's the second time that he's tried to throw that three and two and miss with it. And Darren, Danny Heron's upset about it. He normally does not miss with that hook. Taking a peek at our quest. High speed internet speed pitch. About on cue for both of these guys. Danny's average fastball a little bit over 90. Mike Campton's average fastball a little bit over 88 this year. Not quite the hard thrower. Miguel Tejada, it's away. 1 0 of the count. Well, last inning he started off with a, a leadoff walk. He got out of it with the double play. But now you got the top of the order. The leadoff walk. You got to do something here. You need to get it out against Tejada. You don't want to open yourself up for a big inning. Again, Bourne has 19 bags. Stolen 19 of them. And Danny, seven stolen bases against one thrown out this year. And in his career, 
Only 21% thrown out when he's on the mound. It's well below league average. You mentioned that earlier. Some pitchers, it's just not their specialty. No, Greg Maddox, like you said, is a perfect example of it. Bouncing ball up the ladder. What a pick! What a turn! Double play! Well, how about that infield defense today before the game? Wow, did it come in handy. This was not an easy play to turn. Roberts gets the high hop, great position, throws low and away. Lopez goes down, scoops it, transfers it, and throws it across the diamond. What a great play. Knee work on the bag. Owen won the count to Hunter Pence. A team game, this baseball, and a fine team play behind the ace of this staff. Boy, Felipe Lopez, what a great play at second base. Not only just catching that ball, dragging his knee across the bag and, and still throwing it from without having to stand up accurately over to first. He really picked that man, Ryan Roberts, up. Cut fastball. That's a strike. Two and one. It's called outside. Boy, how good has his cut fastball been this year? Made all the difference in the world for him. Wasn't even really part of things before the Oakland outing last year. Barely if ever threw it. Breaking ball. Fly ball. In the left field. Parr is there. He puts it to bed. It's interesting. And Heron behind him. Roberts made an error earlier in the game. He's gotten three more chances. He's cashed in on all of them. Rapid Rewind. AT&T, the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, your world delivered. Three to one the score. And glad to have you back at the ballpark. Diamondbacks on top. Brandon Backey, the one-time starter, the postseason starter for these Houston Astros. Tough go of it back in the big leagues this year as he faces Lopez and Para and Justin Upton. One thing I always liked about Brandon Backey, and this isn't a play on his name, not at all. He just seemed to, didn't always have the stuff to, but never backed down. Loved attacking hitters and certainly had his brighter moments this year so far, not, not going on. But he's a bulldog. A guy, yeah, he is, and he knows how to pitch. And he's he's pitched some big games for the Astros. Hey, you can say that again. Felipe Lopez has had a fine night. He has singled twice. He has walked. You 
a great defensive play that double play last inning. That pitch is away. Matt Kata is out at second base. Jeff Keppinger moves over to third. Familiar face, huh? As that one slapped the other way, have a night, Felipe Lopez. Three hit nine for Lopes. He came in below 300. He's hitting about 304 now. He is really good with that ball up and elevated away. He loves taking this ball the opposite way. He gets it right there about belt high. Not afraid to shoot the ball to left field, lets it travel, and puts a nice level swing on it. Gerardo Parra. Zach Bunt. Struck out and single. As Jeff Keffinger over at third. Well, they're looking for a bunt. I mean, way in at third. Not interested. By the way, we remind you, browse from the largest selection of team gear, hats, t-shirts, jerseys, collectibles. Get team gear straight from the source. Hop online, dbacks.com slash shop. Yeah, I don't like them butting in this situation. You got a two-run lead, and he's facing a right-handed pitcher this time. Let's see him do some damage with the bat. Bouncing ball off the glove. Is it a little bit of bad luck? Maybe so, but Para will take advantage. That's going to be a base hit. So Para, two hits in the ball game. Went right back through the box. Yeah, much better matchup this time for Para with the right hander on the mound. He takes his fastball running away from him. Back, he gets in terrible fielding position after he releases the ball. His back is turned right to the plate, and that ball hits him in the back. Justin Upton rolled out to short, singled, and walked. Just cannot defend yourself when you know your back is to the plate. Boy, this is the right guy at the right time right now. D-backs have a chance to really do some damage right here with three, four, five coming up. Pitch is high, one and zero. The count. Top of the order did their job. A couple base hits. They've set the table. Felipe setting the table all year. His seventh three hit game in the season. That's tied for third best in the National League. 2 0 the count. Now, if Justin goes out of here, that's six runs for the Diamondbacks. Don't forget giving away three free tacos with the purchase of a large drink tomorrow afternoon and evening. Good friends with Taco Bell at participating locations. We talk about mindset. The mindset of Upton right now is one pitch in one location. If you don't get it, take it. He's looking for one place. And that's ex excellent. A lot of guys who are already made up their mind that they're going to swing because the pitcher's trying to throw a strike 2 and 0. Oh. Not just an Upton. He's looking for that pitch, probably middle in, ready to turn on it. Didn't get it, so he just took it. Same right here. I'm sure he's got the hit sign right now, but he's looking for one pitch in one area. Took the pitch away, tried to pull it. He's angry at himself, isn't he, on that 3 0 swing? Yeah, he knows that that's not his pitch. You know, because if you take that pitch, he's going to have to throw a fastball 3 1. He's got to come at you again. Takes a peek down at Chip Hale. His runner in scoring position is Felipe Lopez. Same scenario. One pitch in one location. If you don't get it, don't swing. Had a pitch up a fastball and couldn't square it up. Both pitches have been kind of just a tick off of what he's looking for. Yeah, both probably would have been called balls. You know, but you want up to swing in the bat. That is a very hittable pitch. Not where back he's trying to throw that ball. That was a he throws a sinker, and that ball was, you know, that was over belt high. The veteran right hander. Got it. Well, he went from 3 0 to strike three and three pitches. That one, I mean, talking about a bulldog, maybe fearless, right down the middle. You know, six straight fastballs. This one was right down the heart. Upton would look like he was a little bit late with this one. Now you got to pick him up. 
you know he's not happy. Boy, he's got that edge. There's no doubt. Good pitch. Back with a changeup, 0-1. Well, now back he's got a little bounce in his step, right? Well, that was a big pick-me-up for him. Yeah, he still has his work cut out for him. He's got a couple guys on with four and five coming up. And this is a good matchup having the left-hand hitter Drew facing Backy. And Backy's usually a guy too that's going to live on the corners. He's a corner pitcher. He's not trying to, you know, outstuff anybody. He needs to live on the corners to be effective. The one one is high two and one the count. Yeah it was late spring training until almost July that back he was on the disabled list that left intercostal muscle. And these guys they keep getting things in good shape. Just keep that stomach and midsection soft you won't pull anything. Old school right. Steven pops it up so unable to. Pick up Justin Upton and Upton. We saw it a moment ago, that edge, that expectation to drive in a run. And how does he do it? How does he deal with balancing that anger, that fire, and keeping it on track? Well, I set my ex expectations high, and, I'm, and sometimes I get bagged on for being too hard on myself. But I, I think that I can be a little lighter on myself, but that's what's got me to where I am now. Um, you know, working hard, and, and when I'm not feeling perfect, try to be perfect. And I think that's something that, I, I myself need to back off on a little bit, but it's what got me here, so I'm going to stick with it. You know, I love that, and I played with a guy that was as hard as on, on himself as anybody I've ever seen. That was Albert Bell with the Cleveland Indians, and he was some kind of run producer. Was it near the player that Justin Upton is going to be? You know, Justin Upton's got everything working his way, but Albert Bell had that same type of intensity. Javelin toss. Love how Kirk Gibson took a peek over his shoulder. I think he felt like he was maybe looking in the mirror. I'm sure he'd been there many times before, correct? Oh, there's no question about it. That guy was about as intense as they came. I mean, he, I had times pitching to him, and I could hear him yelling at me. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. New level of intensity with that man. Well, with it being three to one, you'd hate to not cash in. We're telling some stories here, but the real bottom line of this story is they need to get it done. Just invite Mark Reynolds to the party. Talk about picking up your peers, huh? A four hit night, a three run homer, and every hit has been an extra base hit. Check that slugging percentage in the morning. 6-1. We got a hanging breaking ball. Reynolds all over this pitch. Belt high over the middle of the plate. Because I am not missing this one. Way to pick up Upton. Way to pick up Drew. Way to pick up your starting pitcher. Boy, a night for the ages for Mark Reynolds. Well, you want to talk about a night you'll never forget, and there will be good nights. And he has had big nights throughout his career. That one is drilled deep left field, and I mean way out of here. Where you been, young man? It's good to have you back. Wow, did this ball go a long ways. Reynolds hits the home run. He comes with the fastball this time. Young with the hands a little bit lower. He gets to that sinking fastball, and he deposits that ball way back in left field. Chris Snyder. 
That's some excitement. You bet it's some excitement. The last time these Diamondbacks went back to back in Milwaukee, you know I love that. Mark Reynolds and Justin Upton did it. Tacos, too, by the way. Tacos for everyone. So hit up Taco Bell tomorrow. Where's this team been? I mean, I'm sorry. Hello? Keep doing this. Gibby, what's going on down there? Do it again tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Remember 2007? Well, we all did it all the time. That's fun to see. That's how talented the talent is. And Maybe certainly this year they've lost that swagger and that confidence. It'd be nice to see him go on a run. No matter the end result, when it wraps up in October, it'd be nice to see him for their own sakes go on a nice run. Every single one of them is putting in a long day's work, hard work, preparation, the coaching staff. Everyone's trying to figure out a way to get it right. Tonight they're getting it right. Chris Snyder goes down on strikes. Mark Reynolds with two outs picking up both Upton and Drew. Chris Young saying, I'm feeling my oats again. I think I might be back. Our game summary, Dan Heron uh, doing it himself. 7-1 to one the score, obviously, but he has been fabulous on the mound. One mistake, Carlos Lee got it. Mark Reynolds, a night for the ages. A four-hit night. Now, all of them have been doubles. Chris Young, too, finding his stroke. We talk about how of late he's walking more, now driving more balls. Then with two outs, two of his teammates failing to drive in runs, he picked them all up and then right behind him. Chris Young, the man hitting just 184 coming in, he hoped. And that is the story tonight. Those around your television set are some of the heroes this evening. As Dan Heron gets ready to go to work. Mark Reynolds, the four-hit game tonight, the best since his, not one of his first ever games here at Chase Field. On May 25th, 2007, I mean, he was a baby in the big leagues. We still were figuring out who he was. And when that occurred, he was 5-4-5 five, five in a game here with a triple, two homers against the Houston Astros. He was a double away from hitting for the cycle in that game. And in the at-bat where he needed the double, he homered. That should be more than a cycle. The one, two. <laughs> cycle plus. Lee goes down on strikes. A little bit different than that. And by the way, I don't want to lose track of that. He goes down on strikes on a pitch away. He homered on a pitch away. There's the stubborn man I'm going to show you. Yep. But not only that, but he put a little twist to that one. Little cotter? He cut it. The other one, he tried to throw the two-seamer that come back over the outside corner. 
this time he made it keep going away from Lee. Speaking of cycles, Chris Young, one triple away from the cycle. And he can triple. That's right there in his wheelhouse, which everything appears to be tonight. You got to be excited for that young man huh. for this night. And it's not over for him. That one in on his hands. Don't forget, here in a couple of nights, not tonight, but Saturday, June 27th, the Angels will be in town. A lot of fun. It's 70s night, retro night. Be sure to come dressed in your grooviest 70s gear and win prizes 602 514 or visit dbacks.com. Seventies Brewers fan. Pitch dives away. County Stadium. That's kind of a seventies. Uh, no, no, I'm not sure. And those tube tops. I think those were in the seventies. Three and one. The count to Lance Berkman. He's been successful with Berkman. With the hard stuff. The curveball is where Berkman, you know, stung him. That base hit. High fly center field. Boy, that ball's traveling an awful long way, but Young finds a spot and puts it away. Two outs. So he stayed with the hard stuff, but Berkman was was you know, he was waiting for it. He just missed it, didn't he? And he, after his reaction Second after he got a little bit underneath that ball, uh, he was pretty disgusted with himself because he had a pitch he was looking for. Young goes back. Nice play. Camps under it. Easy out. Breaking ball, and it's a strike to Matt Kata. Dan Heron with 88 pitches with regard to that pitch count. And I think he may be, as he continues to execute, if he can continue to execute against guys like Kata and his mates, he might be eyeing the tape. He might be eyeing the finish line tonight. I would be if I was him. He's had very unstressful innings. He had the last two innings, he's had a chance. To have tough innings to lead off walks, but his defense oh. has picked him up. Oh my goodness! What a clinic! What an inning! And immediately remember, right after the team gets you a basket full of runs, that's how you do it. Coming back to life tonight. Life is good for the D backs. Looking pretty good so far, huh? What do we got coming up in Zeke's zone? Coming up tonight, we're not only going to break down Dan Heron's start tonight, but we're also going to compare him to some of the other aces in Major League Baseball and wonder why his, his wins are as low as they are compared to other 
aces in, in Major League Baseball. And I was teammates with Mike Hamden back when he was just a puppy. Might have a couple stories about him. And I like the new dress code. You're looking sharp tonight, uh, guys. Uh, we'll send sharp. it back to you. Zeke looking pretty good out here. We'll see it. Quest D-backs live after the game. In-game and post-game contributor Greg Swindell. We'll look forward to talking to you guys. Ryan Roberts to lead it off. Well, this is uh, this has been one of those. Can we please bottle up this night and use it as an elixir for bad days? And there have been many this year. We don't hide from that fact. Many more than anybody thought. But it certainly is nice that the way this game has gone so far. Great pitching, great hitting, great defense. Get some great quotes, by the way, from our fine fans. <laughs> That's a good one. Get it down, he says, Quintero. And it dives away. It's a hit right here. Keep that average over 300. Yeah, he's he's had an 0 for 3, but he's had a nice. It's been eventful. That's strike three. FreeCreditReport.com always reminds you to check your score as we take you out of town for our out of town scoreboard. To get your free credit report and score, go to FreeCreditReport.com. Know your score. Roy Halliday. Uh, well, for Roy, an interesting night. Just three innings of work. And 43 pitches. I, I do have to finish the thought on that Yankees Mets game because uh, Luis Castillo, that game at New Yankee Stadium, was about to squeeze a pop up to second base with two runners on for the end of the game. Okay? He was about to put it into his glove, a lazy pop up back of second base. He dropped the ball. The tying and winning run scored. Two outs, it would have been the end of the game. That is must see pictures, folks. I can't even imagine the headlines on the back pages in New York as they're being printed right now. New York is in a buzz, believe me. <laughs> Roy Halliday with a groin injury, by the way, and you can imagine Mr. Complete Games not coming out. And that's a shame. One of my favorites. You know what a what a great pitcher he is. Yeah, and such a hard worker. Three or four years up in Toronto doing their telecasts up there. I mean, that guy is a grinder. He works as hard as anybody in baseball. Dick Peavy's also out for at least a month. He has an ankle tear. Popped up. So now they're taking applications for other great pitchers in the National League Western Division. We know there's Heron Peavy's out. How about Max Scherzer? Our Jack in the Box in the box. Think outside of the box. Do you folks remember the Major League debut for Max Scherzer? And when she came out of the bullpen and stacked up in April double digit strikeouts. An incredible debut for Max. Welcome to the Majors with that electric stuff. Think outside the box. Well, and Max yesterday had a one, I think his finest hour as a Major Leaguer. Fair enough? No question about it. I agree with you 100%. And I love the way that. He kept driving. He wanted the finish line. He kept going. He had the determination to finish. Didn't quite get there, but that's the mindset that you were talking about before of going out there and try to finish what you start. 116 pitches, a career high. Pitches in, and it's strike three. Lopez goes down on strikes. They found a way to finally get Felipe out for the first time. It's still seven to one.
Right back to live action. Dan Heron working quickly. A man who sees that finish line. He fires strike one. And he does so to Jeff Kepinger. Continuing to kill the strike zone. He's just eating up that outside corner too. All night long, whether it's a cut fastball or the two seamer that comes back over the plate, he has been on with his heater. There's a cut fastball that dives away. One and two to count. Those his fastball about half the time when you take a look at what he does with his approach. Cut fastball about 15%. So technically, that's another fastball. So that's about 65% fastballs on average this season. There's one. All part of the chess match for Dan Heron. Setting hitters up and simply put, knocking them down. Here's Danny talking about that chess match. There's pitches that you're setting up. There's pitches that you're not necessarily throwing for strikes or, you know, you're purposely throwing balls or purposely throw a pitch in a certain count to, uh, you know, later in the bat, hopefully you exploit them with a different pitch or with that same pitch. You know, a lot of it is a chess match and, and uh, you know, a guessing game and, you know, hopefully, uh, thinking ahead of, of the hitter, uh, you know, it gives me an advantage. There's the mental side of pitching, trying to stay one step ahead. Well, he does it. Talk about preparation. You realize how important preparation is and what he does before games, you know, how he tracks the team that he's going to be pitching against, looks over video. Just amazing. When he throws a pitch, there's a rhyme and a reason. And he executes about 95% of the time. And the, one of the reasons he can execute because he has got great mechanics. He collects himself in that hesitation out there where that leg comes up and he collects himself and then everything gets going towards the plate. Everything comes out of the same arm slot. Just outstanding. And he fields his position. Part of that chess match as we talk about is not only strike three but strike two. We talked about it earlier. The setup pitch. Splitter down in the dirt. Goes away. Gets him. Fastball away. He doubles up on it. Nails it again. Fastball away. Feeble swing. Down at the splitter. Gets him. Splitter away. Curveball in. No chance. The combination of pitches. Cutter away. Cutter again. Combination of pitches is what gets you strikeouts and what's get you outs. A lot of guys will talk about hey, you got to speed their bats up. Then you get them out with soft stuff. Slow their bats down and get them out with hard stuff. It's all about setting hitters up. Mackey can hit. He's got four big league homers so he will be handled as such no doubt. Two and one the count. You could see his first plate appearance this season. Same two teams tomorrow night. This game earlier, don't forget, 5 o'clock. As that one swung right through. And then after the game, a lot of fun. Lifehouse in concert. Make sure to join us for that one tomorrow evening. We'll see you at the ballpark. 5 o'clock game, concert immediately following. The 2-2. Two -two. Rung him up. Over the outside corner with a cut fastball. 103 pitches.
Fox Sports Arizona presents Diamondbacks Baseball, brought to you by Southwest Airlines. They're ready when you are. Go to southwest.com, grab your bag, it's on. And by Blippi, America's sub shot. Dan Heron really pushing the Astros to the wall. We had some great video, Tom Candiotti, a moment ago. The visit from his pitching coach. Tell us what the reaction is. Watch his finger. I'm out there. He said, don't even bother talking to me right now. I'm out there. I feel fine. Look, at he's not even really giving me any eye contact. Good. And I like that. No need to even make that visit, really. Well, you don't ask him in the sixth inning. You don't ask him in the fourth. Let him go out there until he tells you he doesn't have enough. I love it. I love it. 103 pitches. This is a team that has seen its bullpen struggle, but on the flip side has seen a pretty significant drop in complete games. Pudge Rodriguez, future Hall of Famer and a member of these Houston Astros, goes to work behind home plate. Pudge getting the off night with Dan Heron working. The benefits of being a future Hall of Famer. That's right. Oh boy. You can be selective, right? <laughs> <laughs> Say that with respect to Absolutely. what he has accomplished as a player. Unmatched as a catcher, really. Because you know if he was sitting right here, we'd both be teasing him about it. Yeah. You would. Well, yeah. You I played would. in the big leagues for a long time. <laughs> I'd sit and run real fast. Heron looks on. As the three one from Tara is juiced into left center field. It's gone. How far did he hit that baseball the other way? Gerardo Parra, he will touch him all. His first home run came in his first at bat. Here's his second home run. Boy, a little guy with a big wallet. He gets a pitch. Oh, full extension on that ball. Put some backspin on it. And that's why he got all the carry. Wow. He didn't pull that ball. That went a long ways. <laughs> that was great. Another home run by a Diamondback. So Para has homer. Reynolds has homer. And Young has homer. I love that fan. He caught it. Looked down to Michael Bourne and said, uh-uh, I caught it, not you. I can catch two. <laughs> a lot of times in this ballpark, that call sitting up here for a broadcaster gets challenging. Where is it going to land? What's going to happen? I've learned it in my first few years. That fan made it easy for me because you could see him tracking the ball all the way in. In on the hands, good pitch. <laughs> Tracked it all the way in. I got it. Michael Bourne, you didn't. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> That's a great seat. Remember that when you're picking your seats to come to the ball game. Maybe a fun place to sit out there. He's ready again. He's got his glove there. He's ready. He wants another one. Next time I get a TV off day, I'm going to see if uh, I'll be able to grab a ticket out there. Looks like a fun spot to see a game. Kind of a balcony setup hanging right over the action. Two and two, the count to Upton. Hope to see you out here this weekend. Team about ready to hit the road again. Chases a slider down and away for Upton. Nova. Home loans in game, a box score. And Felipe Lopez, Gerardo Parr with a good night. Justin Upton has single. Some frustration has gone along with it as well. That edge that he told us about earlier. Mark Reynolds and Chris Young, though. Mark Reynolds. Goodness. He's going to get another shot. Look at that. Every bat, every at bat, it's like life or death. Intensity. But I don't think that bat's going to make it. Now he thought about it, but you're right. There he goes. No, nope. that one bounces in there. We saw him in Los Angeles, and I know you saw the the pictures, Candy Man. I think you're on the radio side of him 
talking and yelling into his helmet. Yes. His youngster and his teammate, about the same age, those two, he homered in the inning. Steven drew a mile high to right. He just missed it. I mean, just missed it. Uh, one of those nights that they want to keep the bat or the ball for baseball's Hall of Fame. Mark Reynolds is having one of those. Have you ever visited the Baseball Hall of Fame? For all our baseball fans, those 70% of you, and we know that it's difficult to travel and all the things that go into getting the money together in the trip, those 70% that have it, we hope and pray you get the chance someday. 30% call and tell those 70% that it was worth it. The mecca of baseball. I've been told by many people that you can be there for a week. Yeah, holy absolutely. I, I was only able to go for a couple of days when I went. Back in 98, my father was inducted. The 0 1. Pop foul off to the right side and into the seats it goes. Hey, don't forget this Sunday, the first 5,000 kids to tomorrow's game will receive a Baxter soap dispenser, and that's good news. Kids' day at the ballpark. Stick around after the game to run the bases. We'll see you Sunday, the Baxter soap dispenser for all the youngsters. 602 514 8400. And again, we'll see you Sunday. Visit dbacks.com. Run the bases after the game. One and two, the count. Picked on a hanging breaking ball. And Homer laid off that one. And two of his mates have made it out just prior to, and this is what he did behind him. He capitalized. He picked his guys up. Integrity in the lineup. Some interesting things that go on this year when Reynolds is in the lineup producing. Out front, pops it up. We'll talk more about it. Here tomorrow when we come on the air. But for now, all eyes on number 15 as he looks to reach the finish line. His team up seven. Because he has had that glove on his hands. You don't have to do it all with the bat. And remember, he made an early error. He has been fabulous to pick himself up. And when you do that, that is a cool play. You don't have to have four hits to help your ace win. Not at all. And tonight he's pitched like an ace. He's looking at the finish line. And the man who says his name in vain these days, though he walked, is Michael Bourne. Been interesting watching him face Michael mm. Bourne. He has had some ugly swings against Heron. Danny's had the best of him. And he, he's mixing everything up with him. You bet. You know, he's, he's throwing the two seamer away, 
He's coming with the cutter in. He's throwing the split down. And then he's throwing the hook down and in. And he's hit everything on him. Breaking ball, it's a ground ball with good speed. You got to play clean, and you do. Had him play perfectly, too. And it, we talk about the power of anticipation when you have a pitcher that's putting the ball where he's supposed to. It's a breaking ball. Drew's looking for that ball probably to his left. And he gets it right there. Talk about the Diamondbacks and their pitchers. Maybe trying to put together a collective effort to take the ball deeper of late. Maybe bail that bullpen out. Just one complete game this year it was thrown by Dan as he fires strike one. It was April 27th against Chicago. Nine innings, 111 pitches. All of his mates look on as he does incredible work. He's still bringing it up there too. 92 miles an hour on that fastball. To the right side. I mean, he has been good literally every time out this year. There's no doubt about it. Every start has been a quality start. He's gone seven or more, nine of his last 12. His last two starts, he went his seven. He gave up one run. The bullpen has struggled. Tonight, he gives the bullpen a break. The one, two. Ground ball. Heron can't make the play, but Felipe Lopez can. One out away from a complete game victory. There has not been one game this year that Danny Heron has thrown that he could not have won. Hunter Pence digs in. Two outs, eight to one the score. Popped it up. 0 oh and 1. Yet another first pitch strike. Economical 101. Coming into this inning, he had 18 of 27 first pitch strikes. 12 times, three pitches or less to a batter. Bouncing ball. Felipe Lopez. Dan reaches the finish line. He wins for the fifth time this year. Mike Hampton, the losing pitcher. Heron, absolutely incredible. Eight to one the final. He gives up just two hits. His eighth career complete game. His second of the year for a team that has struggled mightily. And I mean mightily this year. That's inspirational stuff tonight. Okay, I'm getting